Welcome to the King on Yoga podcast. This episode signals what we're really trying to do with this project, real and frank conversations with real people on important issues. There you go. Of course, we all have to talk about asana and our feelings and experiences in Mysore, but it's these kind of applied yoga situations as we talk about today, where yoga comes into relation with actual life that really, really get me engaged, that really matter for me. For As I'm completely honest about in the forthcoming episode, and both of us in fact, life throws us curveballs and yoga is an invaluable way of learning to deal with them, of being able to deal with them. So I think like many, I don't know what would have happened to me if I hadn't found a daily routine in yoga as I did. Pratima of True Bay India shares my early struggles with mental health and how coming to yoga proved to be transformational in dealing with this for her as it was for me. So holding an executive position in a finance company, she calls herself a high achieving depressive or something like that, saying no one would have ever guessed how she felt inside, which was the same again with my experience. So the very point of yoga is it allows us to go back in and connect, reconnect. So we don't feel so separate, right? We're playing an act. Our conversation is one of the most open and frank up to date. Pratima also detailing the subsequent manipulation and abuse she unfortunately suffered when she went on to practice in an experience um, in Mysore, in, not in Mysore, in a, in a Mysore style charla in her native Mumbai. So I know you will enjoy this episode and I encourage you to look at Pratima's excellent work on True Bay India and the spread of Ashtanga in India where it has recently really taken off, partly due to Pratima. As always, if you feel you benefited from this podcast, benefited at all, please donate. One-off or monthly subscriptions are really appreciated to continue the work that we're doing here. And also, if you're listening on iTunes, don't forget to donate or review (laughs) there. (laughs) So without further ado, here's Pratima. Okay, so today's guest is Pratima from True Bay, India. Um, so welcome Pratima to the Kiran Yoga podcast. Um, hey Adam, uh, thank you so much for having me on. How are you? Oh, oh, yeah, I'm, oh thanks for asking. Um, oh, fine. Um, I'm really excited to have you and, and just let me t- uh, ask you a little bit about what you've been doing there with True Bay. Uh, so uh, you're asking me pre-pandemic or during the pandemic because they're, they're two totally uh, different stories. <laughs> well, both. A, a quick, a quick synopsis of both, just to give our uh, listenership a little overview of what you're doing. So you're based so in they, Mumbai. Yes, I'm based in Mumbai. Uh, Chube is basically um, the you know India's first homegrown uh, premier Mashtanga yoga. A workshop and retreat organizer and I've been bringing top international uh, Ashtanga yoga teachers to India since January 2019 and in the pandemic I've gone online so that's just basically the quick snapshot of what I do. Yeah yeah like everyone else and you've had a lot of teachers I mean I think if, did you, have you have you had Shirachi there with you? Yes yes that's it a, was actually well, the first time he was teaching outside of Mysore with a Indian uh, practitioner audience. That's incredible. It must have been amazing. It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was great having him. And you're still doing online workshops there and uh, and you sometimes interview people as well, I think. And Yeah, yeah. that was what I was doing last year, but I took a break this year from the interviews. uh, You know, uh, it was fun. uh, I did start something called Conversations Beyond Asanas. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to ask questions uh, to teachers, which uh, I think a lot of practitioners would want to ask, but don't ask, which is beyond, yeah. you know, like, how do I get into Marie Chasana? I didn't want to ask all those questions. Yes, uh, it's boring. You know? yeah. <laughs> and it's boring for them too. It's yeah. like, you know, I think they want to tear their hair, you know, hair out. Like if one more person asks me how to do 
know, yes. something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I wanted to make it like a fun, um, sort of like show the, the human face uh, be, behind those teachers, you know, like make them like feel accessible to people and not like really... Um, the destil is too strong a word, but I, I just wanted them, I, I just wanted whoever was watching to feel like this person is just like me. Uh, yeah. And, you know, to understand where their journey was and how they came into yoga and, uh, you know, issues that they face in their lives or whatever, yeah. you know. I just, and, yeah. So I, like it was fun manifesto. doing it while, uh, you know, while I could handle it. <laughs> and uh, I suppose um, that's quite a nice segue actually into into what we want to talk about today, which is our our background and our how we both came to yoga. And um, I guess that that idea of kind of the normalcy of 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 just showing the real the real side of of practitioners, people, and the struggles they go through, I think is is increasingly important to me. I think, um, and and I think you also have a background where you're you've been. Um, You've been honest and open about um, suffering depression and getting to yoga as a right. as a way to as to cope and, and heal. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think you were you also in a, in a quite a high powered job, right? And, and suffering, you say high functioning, high yeah. functioning, uh, high functioning depression. depression. Yeah. And uh, as a, uh, a vice president of uh, like a financial, were you finance? Like a private equity. Uh, I was in like equity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I believe that's finance. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've never, <laughs> I've never done, a, I've never done a proper job. I'm just a, unfortunately, or fortunately, I've just been a yoga teacher. So, um, oh wow. Yes, well, yeah. <laughs> Someone, someone's got to do it. Um, <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so, so I've never been a professional. But anyway, um, and you were you were high functioning in that work, and uh, and 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 then you, 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 uh, what? How how did you get into? It? Could you could you not cope anymore, or or you know how did it go that you found uh, you found yoga? And was it that you came to Ashtanga straight away, or how did that how did that transpire for you? No, so uh, I didn't I didn't sort of seek yoga because I was um, suffering from high functioning depression. Okay. Uh, high functioning depression is basically that people cannot see that you that you have symptoms. It's mm. just that you uh, you know you're having them, right? Yeah, so if okay. someone's looking looking at you and you know you're top of the game in 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 your workplace and yeah. you know you're cracking all these jokes and people think everything's fine. It's only when you come home is when you know in in the solitude of your room is when you 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 know what's going on in your head, right? Mm. Uh, so. Mm. Uh, for me, I, I was in a very, very stressful job uh, and um, I hadn't, uh, it, it, it came, yoga came to me out of, it wasn't planned. So I was, I happened to randomly uh, look at an Instagram post, uh, which suddenly popped up on my feed through a common friend. And I saw Deepika's post about a mountain retreat in the Himalayas and I hadn't had a taken a day off from work in I think over one and a half years and I was stressed out and I had grown up in the mountains and I saw a mountain retreat and I just jumped at it I wrote to her uh, in a week I was at that retreat and I think that retreat was transformational for me mm. because that's when I discovered Ashtanga I discovered uh, a different way of being the practice was addictive I started eating differently uh, I started looking at the world differently and if from the time I did the retreat to setting up Trube was a good five years right. uh, but mm. in that process I I realized like you know I think I always knew that I wanted to like I I felt something was not right with me I had gone to a psychiatrist once and he said, you know, he, he he actually told me I'm imagining my symptoms because he couldn't believe that I was depressed. Mm. Um, and he sent me packing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I knew that I, you know, that that something was something was missing. Mm. Uh, and through the practice, because it brings up so much. Right. And I would I would have these moments and whatever through the mat and, um, and 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 that basically got me at one point when I was 
I think really doing well in my career, everything was, you know, like all of the things uh, that I needed to check off in my life were all checked off. Uh, but I was just feeling this sense, lack of purpose, like, um, yeah, I was going to ask how, yeah. Joy. How, yeah, how did, how did that, how did it feel? How did the, the, the at, depression feel to you? At that time, it, you know, all that, all that time, it was because of being in, uh, private equity, you, your, your entire body language is almost aggressive, right? Because mm, you built mm-hmm. a whole, uh, shield around yourself because you're in this very competitive um you know uh world uh which is primarily uh men um mm. and and so you're fighting that and then so you put on this very tough exterior and I remember going through this phase where I would come home and just be crying and not because of the stress of work because yoga was helping me manage the stress and whatever mm. Mm. but I just remember being like having a great day at work and then just coming back home and crying like a fool and I you know one day I just said like what is going on why am I crying like this there's something on off and Mm. I made an SOS or sent an SOS SMS to somebody and you know uh, that person was kind enough to get me the best psychiatrist in Bombay who I went and met and uh, who diagnosed me as high functioning and and then I went into you know sort of counseling and medication and you know certain lifestyle changes and uh, mm-hmm. All of that, uh, which sort of put me into, you know, a much different place than what I was in at that time when I had that, um, mm-hmm. you know, that sense of listlessness or whatever, you know. Yeah, and that helped, right? The counselling and the medication, and um, yes, it right, did. Yeah, it yeah, it yeah, did. Yeah. I think it was a combination of all of that, right? The CBT counselling, the medication. Uh, yoga, uh, and, you know, speaking to my psychiatrist on a monthly basis, it really helped. So initially, I was doing a lot of counseling and therapy. But the idea of therapy is that you're supposed to, you know, do the homework and get the tools so that you can go and live a fulfilling life, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. And so I, I put in that work of, you know, understanding, like all of the you know, all of the CBT exercises, which is cognitive behavior therapy. Um, And, uh, you know, looking at thought patterns and why I was reacting in a particular way and why I was ruminating. Uh, So those exercises really sort of helped to understand, uh, even with my therapist, to understand, uh, you know, me and to give me solutions and, you know, Mm. the tools. Mm -mm. Um, And I think CBT is something, irrespective of whether you go to a psychiatrist or not, I think CBT is something I recommend to everybody. Um, Come to behavioral therapy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, I mean, I, I went through it as well. And I'm, I don't know whether you're still taking the medication, but to share a bit of my background, I was also uh, very similar, actually. I had very high functioning. Um, mm-hmm. No one would have known, you know, I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I was always, always joking around. And yeah, I don't think anyone uh, would have guessed in a million years that I was depressed. It mm-hmm. was a, but it was this mm. ten incredibly, incredibly tiring to keep it all up, you know. Um, yeah, and, the facade, uh, right? Yeah, it was very, very much an act, and it, and it took all my energy to keep that act because mm. I was terrified of people seeing me as depressed, mm. um, and especially as a guy back then, maybe mm. you know, this is mm. the nineties, and, and to seem, somehow feel that that people would see me as weak, um, mm. and uh, and and yeah, I was I was terrified of being discovered, so. Yeah, mm. um, I was I was medicated uh, with antidepressants. Mm. I don't know what you were taking, um, and I also knew that that was a short. I didn't want to stay on them forever. You know, I kind of felt mm. like, like, okay, you know, this is a temporary period, and I was desperate mm. to get off them. But mm. at a point, at a point, I felt. I mean, just going to talk for a second more, and then I'll let you back to it. But at the point, I felt like the, the talking wasn't enough. I, I I kind of went every week to the the counselor's office, or and it was mm. first of all, it was this, then it was a different kind of uh, counselling, and then it was a different mm. kind of. And it was all just in the end. It was just me telling the story, and the, and you know, I could very well articulate, you know, how I felt, uh, what the tri- what the triggers were, why the reasons were in my background that might have caused certain um, you know uh, pathology symptoms that were coming up in my daily life and reactions. But I couldn't really get out of the knot, and I, I kind of felt something's missing, and, and that's the point. And um, I really 
thought there's something in the very, very tissue of the body that needs to be extricated somehow. You know, it's the, this, yeah. this, these feelings, this, this heaviness, whatever I could, if I could translate the feeling I had to a visceral feeling, which is very tangible in the very body itself, it's here, it's in the body, and it needs to somehow be purged in a, in a way that can't be done through just talking it out. Yeah. Yeah, um, I hear you. Yeah. So, um, I mean, was that was that your experience? I mean, you coming to yoga? Did did it? I mean, because from I suppose what I want to say, the long and short of it is that as soon as I hit the mat and I started doing that, it was suddenly felt very cathartic. I mean, in a way that I'd never had just with talking and with with drug therapy. Oh yeah, for sure. I think um, like for me, I came to yoga first and then went into medication. So right. for me, it was a different thing. So I, I felt the yoga was bringing up like, like as you very, um, very beautifully articulated, like, you know, you had that thing that you needed to get out of your body, right? So for mm. me, it was yoga was trying to bring that out of my body, but it was mm. mixing up because there was so much of whatever that was in there, right? Stress, trauma, whatever, uh, which I think uh, needed more than just yoga, mm. uh, you know, with therapy or whatever, it needed that. And uh, I I think once I got back, because I, then th th I sort of stopped yoga. And when I started therapy and medication, that didn't work per se. They kept pushing me, saying, you love yoga, please go back to the mat uh, and start practicing. And I think that, you know, when I went back to the mat and I started my Mysore practice, that was transformational because it just changed my whole life around. Uh, I think that um, because of being a type A personality, I liked the, uh, you know, the What's the word? Um, yeah, the se the sequence, the the, the sequence, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, that that the routine. The routine <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so it, yeah. it wasn't like I could be, uh, I could do the mindfulness uh, in a way where I wasn't thinking, oh my god, what's the next pose? Or yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I, I think I really un understood why it was called a moving meditation. Because that inner journey that sort of really started bring, like healing me. And I, I mean, I think yoga just is just such a beautiful healing practice. And did it feel like that? Did it feel like that straight away, though? Can I just ask? It, when you could, because it didn't, I mean, I, what I want to stress here is that it didn't for me. I knew it was great. And after I finished, oftentimes I would feel like I did before that kind of darkness encroached on me. Let, you know, not to be too dramatic, you know, mm -hmm. and so so I'd recognise that there was something going on. But to get to the mat and to go on the mat, it, uh, you know, day in day, day that's out, that's like climbing that, my Mount Everest, right? It, it, it was, it, you know, from a, as a depressed person, it was incredibly, incredibly hard to make myself do it and yeah. start. And and um, yeah, incre and the struggle was was really there. Um, yeah, undeniably, so it was. Yeah, I knew it was good. I knew I felt great afterwards. But I mean, to do it was a really, really, uh, it was very, pa literally painful um, to, to uh, for, for a number, and you know, not just for a day or for a month, it was, you know, obviously not a day, but it was for years, actually, for a good couple of years, I felt like I had to make myself with all my, all my power possible, you know, all the, anything I could do to get on that mat, you know, and do it, you know. I, hear I didn't you. want to I, be there. I think, yeah. I think for me, what, what really helped was that uh, I had found a shala where uh, the teacher was very particular about uh, the student that he accepted. And right. uh, he was very clear that if I was going to uh, start a Mysore practice with him, uh, if I didn't show up, then I could not come back. So, oh, I think who's that? that sounds uh, Ajay. Uh, no, no, it's it's <laughs> not another teacher on the list, and not not okay, okay. You would know. Okay, uh, okay. So, uh, yeah. and he put the fear of God in me, which was kind of scary. But uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to go down that path. But it was it sort of put 
made like it sort of like made like I made sure that I uh reached my practice time which was 6 30 in the morning and I was yeah. you know so I prepped before so I think that for me helped a lot because that fear of not having a class to go to because by then Deepika who was my teacher was traveling mm-hmm. so I didn't have a teacher and this was the only other person I could go to so I was like if I screw this up I'm not gonna get a Ashtanga practice in Bombay so that was actually helped me because it forced me to get out of bed it forced me to Mm -hmm. jump into the shower and do that routine and pack my bag the previous day Mm -hmm. all of that Mm -hmm. so that sort of put me on that discipline of the mind soul practice and the healing and uh eating better and you know I think it it's all becomes byproducts right Adam I think you know when you you know, you I start think, doing one, you know, then you automatically start eating right. It, and, well, yeah, I mean, I think what it does is, for me, I, I reflect back on those times often. And, and the weird thing is, when you're depressed, you almost don't want to be better. And that's a, mm. it's a very so paradoxical cycle. situation yeah. where you feel like you can't do it. You feel like you're not, you're not able, you don't have the, you don't trust yourself to be able to get out of the hole. And also, almost, you don't feel worthy to get out. You feel that, that you know, there's something about, you don't, you don't feel good enough to 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 feel happy, and um, it's just a strange thing to say. So I think for me as well, just doing something, which even if I didn't feel that way in the morning, just doing it affirms that I was able and wanted to make that change, even if I didn't feel it. It kind of was a marker and a very helpful demonstration of intent. That that, that that's I think what I wanted to say um, to, to start me off. Okay. This is a change that you're, you've decided to make, even if you don't feel like doing it, even if it doesn't feel like it represents you. This is your deepest intent that you do want to be better. You do want to be able to get out of bed and lead a normal life. Um, and I think it, it was it kind of de- demonstrated something to me to to get out of bed, have a shower, you know, early, you know, like not lie in bed, you know. And yeah, and, yeah, and then yeah, as soon as you've done that, and obviously, um, not obviously, but it did seem that gradually those bad behavior patterns in terms of, you know, eating and for me, uh, drinking alcohol, um, seem to slip, sleep away quite nicely and smoking as well. I was a big smoker. I love smoking. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, I wanted to say though, that that you were going to a Shala where I was doing it at home. So that was that a very motivating. Yeah. Was that a motive? I was too, to be honest, I was too scared. I was, I was at a place where you wouldn't have known it again as a guy. I was, I was a lot of, there was a lot of bravado around me. Yeah. And the way that I was acting in in, mm. in social social circles, mm. but actually to go to a Charlotte in the morning, I was petrified. So mainly, I was um, going to teachers now and again, or you know, I'd do a workshop. But a lot of it was mainly in my bedroom. Yeah, but you, it was helpful but for you to go to, a to you. Hats off to you to be able to have gotten out of bed, shard, and done a self practice when you were depressed. I think that is phenomenal because I know how hard that is I because just there are days the other, when you other, just yeah, can't yeah. get out of bed right it was when terrible it was terrible yeah it was it was physically like a the the, the feeling is like yeah I don't know I, I mean it's an incredibly po- poignant and powerful feeling of kind of dragging yourself against this huge tide that was transpiring against you almost it's very interesting to know how to kind of look back essentially and see how the how your mental health can be so so catastrophic and so overwhelming and and uh you know i mean and this period for me it, yeah there was a history there but it, it kind of arrived um kind of out of the blue in a way you know and then it kind of it, it kind of took over you know gradually um yeah so um but i had to i mean i suppose what i wanted to say is i had to um the the other option was was really dark so um it really felt like there, there was no option i just had to do this and yeah yeah Wow. So how you're saying that your journey was uh, you first recognized that you needed help. And so you went on to medication, et cetera, and then you found yoga or was it before? Uh, God, let me, um, let me see. I think it was probably a couple of years of taking antidepressants and having CBD and different kinds of therapies. Um, right. And then, yeah. And then, I suppose I didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to be medicated all my life. And uh, yeah, I felt that the therapies were just talking around the same old issues. And I was getting very 
very clever at explaining all my situations, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, how they, yeah, how, <laughs> yeah. I knew, how I you know, how I knew what was going on and you know, yeah. whatever. So it didn't work. And and um yeah, so I, I don't know. And in the end I thought, well, it must be something physical. If I could change something physical about it, then I could somehow change the mindset, which is, you know, at that time was still kind of unusual because it was always the other way around, right? That you change the mindset and you know. And then, the, you know, the person starts acting, you know, quote unquote, normally again, you know, but actually I thought well, if, if I changed my behavior, like it's like CBD really, I suppose. If I changed my eating and my, my physical practice, if I became very healthy, then, um, well, a lot of it was to do also with anxiety. And I tell you a funny reflection I have now talking to you is that I thought if I strengthen my stomach, it, it, it sounds weird. If I strengthen my stomach and I become strong in my core, then I'll be able to overwhelm the anxiety. Strange to say, yeah. It just, yeah, but it just, that's an interesting way to uh, put it. Mm, yeah, I, you know, it, it felt like it, it kind of like it was in my stomach. So I thought if I strengthened that area, yeah, I would be able kill, to resist kill it. anxiety. Uh, uh, yeah, take kind out of. Take sword and sort of kill it. Yeah, away. kind of. Yeah, yeah. I did, I, yeah, it just comes to me now. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. So for me, it was that journey, and but yeah, I mean, you know, it took a couple of years um, to to settle down a bit, and during the practice as well, some biz- the, of the bizarrest kind of feelings would come up and I have no words to say what they were but they were such strange um oh, yeah. almost like almost I would say like energy in the body um like having electric shocks almost you know it was very very um very strange what was coming out at that time um yeah so I, I suppose I've spoken enough about my my journey with it how how was it with you I mean you've done it for a number of years now right and- yeah I I think like I think the initial I wish that that one of the things that I wish I knew was that yoga was going to bring up stuff because you, you know, a lot, like I think most people come to it as a physical thing, right? You want to either lose weight or, uh, you know, you just, whatever, whatever reason gets people mm. the asana, mm. right? Mm. Uh, mm. And, and if you, you, you haven't done enough of the work of understanding what yoga is, then you're going, kind of like surprised with, why after a great class, you suddenly feel like you want to start crying or why Mm. uh, you get out of class and something triggers you and you lose your shit. Mm. So I, in, in the initial part, uh, I felt my emotions were actually exploding and I was getting worried at what was going on. And I was like, what is this yoga doing to me? And I wasn't mm. able to understand or process that it was actually bringing up stuff. It took me a couple of years, right? Because it was, mm. uh, and and I think that was sort of like a bit overwhelming uh, because I couldn't handle what was what would come so there'd be some days where uh, I'd feel amazing and I'd be on top of the world and there'd be some days where I've had a great class and then something just triggers it and I have like a shitty day so I I I think that I wish I knew that there was somebody to tell me that this is normal this is you know Mm -hmm. if you did a hip opening it is going to release some stuff or if you did some back bends or whatever, you are going to get triggered. I wish, you know, that, you know, I think at the start of the journey, I think it's really important. I feel for teachers to sort of like reassure students that this is also going to come up. Yeah. I mean, I think it increasingly, I think the teacher needs some kind of contextualization within the sphere of mental health or you know yeah. trauma train i mean I, 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 you know i'm reticent with all these trainings and stuff but you know, but i think that i think the teacher isn't a therapist but they're not a gym teacher either and Correct. what they do what, what they're doing is something which does bring a lot of stuff up for people and uh, okay they're, they're not going to therapize you know they're not in the position are probably qualified to you know counsel the student and they probably shouldn't step into that role right that, that's not their role but on the other hand i think they at least need to paint the picture to contextualize the facts that like you said to the student that maybe it's not just going to be all good maybe it's not just going to be relaxing and you know super chilled out and you know it's and not stuff going to be unicorns and rainbows yeah yeah you know? and and, they, and and i suppose that at least assure the student and somehow be able to 
perhaps point them in different directions. You know, okay, I'm, you know, like without trying to, you know, and it's easy for the teacher because they want to be, you know, they want to to feel that they're, you know, looked up to, yeah, like they're in mm. control, that they are, that, you know, that they keep their authority, that they're not, you know, seen as not knowing, they're not seen as not knowing something. And I think one, it's important to say you don't know, to say like if someone comes up to you and says, you know, for example, you know, they're laying on to you, you know, stuff about their mental health, you know, you, you know, to, to admit you don't know and you're not qualified to do that, right? Yeah. But also to be able to say, okay, well, you know, you know, from my understanding of health, not just on the map, but, you know, I'm interested as a teacher, hopefully, in health, you know, and in, in, in a wider perspective. Well, look, there's different avenues, right? Like, I mean, EMDR, uh, EMD, um, the, the, how do you say, a- EMDR, I think that's correct. So it's the, the rapid eye movement modality, for example. I mean, that right. um, best, I've, been, uh, I've interviewed on my podcast, Bessel van der Kolk, uh, recently, and he is really uh, very much behind uh, as, as utterly incredible, this rapid eye movement therapy, right? And we talked right. at the end of the, pod, of the podcast, if you haven't um, heard it, I mentioned the Drifty idea, which he hadn't heard before, but he was actually really surprised. So actually, I've been proud to having having introduced Bessel van der Kolk to the idea of Drifty. <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, but he actually said, yeah, that's very much like this possibility of this. And, and, and I trained in it and I did it with students for a while. And not to say that a teacher should do that, but or recommend someone else do that. But it's just one example of different modalities that one can bring to bear as a teacher. Because I think that as much as you're an asset teacher, you're also a resource book or a, a, a director. Yeah, like almost or, like a facilitator, right? Like I think yeah, like for, while, yeah, for pointing while people in different, yeah, in different like, directions. Like a, like a home yeah. teacher, a home teacher. Yeah, you're like yeah. you're like the home teacher and the asana is like the home class, you know, the home peer. It's like basic therapy. It's basic, it's simple. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't need an, a, a super expert, I would say, right? Um, you know, um, and, and then you, you know, you use different experts and you use different teachers and you can refer people to different places or books or things. But um, I, I guess that also paints a picture of a teacher who is really doing the work themselves as well, really like pursuing yeah, he- health on, on, on a deeper level. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And I also think that I think the what I think a lot of uh, you know, as you rightly said, that because a lot of teachers um, want the authority uh, and maybe sense that their students have mental, like a lot of people come into yoga rooms because they have mental health issues. Mm-hmm. I, I, I see that a lot. And I feel like uh, not pointing them to medical, you know, a qualified doctor or therapist uh, is actually failing your student, mm-hmm. you know? uh, and I think that it's really that's my perspective. I think that there are a lot of things that a teacher cannot. How many people are you going to manage? You cannot solve everybody's problems, uh, and they're not problems, right? Mental illness is not a problem; it's, it's an illness. <laughs> no. Uh, and I think a teacher trying to fit into the shoes of a therapist or a doctor is really dangerous stuff, which I think people have been doing. Uh, and I think that's yeah, something but... that is very problematic in uh, you know, yoga rooms, uh, not just to stronger, I mean, generally across the world, right? And that's where the abuse of power begins, right? Because... Uh, this person who's come uh, feeling vulnerable and then surrendering to this teacher and then getting manipulated because their mental state isn't that good. Mm, 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 You know, mm, I think that sort mm. of lays down the seed of abuse. And, uh, uh, you know, a secure teacher is able to tell you that, look, I, like for me, I think I've been great with, like to have had the pika at the start of my mm. Ashtanga journey because she would always say, you want asana, I will, you know, like she's like, I'm the asana teacher. But if you want other advice, financial advice, or, you know, she'd kid around and say, you want sex life advice, I don't come to me. I don't have mm. those answers. And I mm. think that sort of gives you that, that teacher is acknowledging saying, these are the things I'm good at. There's other stuff that I'm working at, at as well. 
right? Yeah. And I'm extremely yeah, yeah, secure yeah. as a teacher. Mm-hmm. And that gives you a lot of confidence in that person as a teacher. It doesn't take away from, oh, she doesn't know everything. She's not, you know, the answer to everything. So I think that's, uh, I think it's a very healthy way to be as a teacher. Yeah, I think a lot of it's to do with market forces on yoga and the, and the teacher kind of then has to overclaim and, and you know, compete against other people peers to to be that knowing teacher right if you know that I think there's that yeah, fear yeah, in the teacher where they say like oh I don't know you know I don't really know you know um, and then they think well there's someone down the road will say I do you know and it's you know like and then at a point you know right like and the, you know the teacher feels like well you know if I should know then you know like to make sure that I keep these students I think there's something that has a lot to do with that and I, but I mean the manipulation thing that you mentioned as well I think is an interesting thing and and do you think I mean, one, how to recognize it, um, you know, how to recognize that one is being manipulated. And two, why why do we as humans, I mean, this is a kind of existential question, I suppose, do that to each other, each other in the first place? You know, I, I've never really understood it as a teacher who's never really demanded much. I've never been a power trip kind of person. But I see that a lot in the Ashtanga world, this wielding the power and control. And it kind of puzzles me, I suppose. It's, yeah. yeah. It, I've, I've, you know, if, if you, if you, like I'm, I'm a very independent, excessively opinionated, headstrong person, uh, and I was in a situation where I was manipulated by a Ashtanga teacher. Mm. How did that transpire? I, Could you say so, anything more about that? Yeah. Uh, so it, 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 like I said, right when I was going through this thing with therapy mm. and mm. Uh, my my therapist, you know, it was literally the goal for next week is you have to go and do yoga. So it, you know, we went through three weeks of therapy where before I actually made the call to this teacher and said, I want to start practice, right? Mm. And and so I was already in a vulnerable state because I was just put on these. Um, you know, SSRI medication, and it, it obviously takes six to eight weeks before it starts its work, and your mm. symptoms get uh, worse before you get better. So I was in that raw, vulnerable phase, um, and I had obviously put on a lot of weight because of not exercising. And then, you know, when you uh, when mm. you're an emotional eater, then mm. you know, you've mm. put on weight. So I was obviously not feeling very good with my body image, self-esteem, whatever. You know, I was just conscious of my, you know, I had never been that down in my life. And mm. that's the space that, that I went into the shala. And this person tried to get me off the medication saying no you stop the medication and you only do yoga and I was right uh I refused to do that because I knew Good. that's not yeah. the path yeah. I wanted I knew that I needed medication I knew that only yoga was not going to heal me so uh but I found that because the yoga was healing Right. And I, I was uh, I was in this very excessively traditional shala where, you know, poses were given out like these cookies, which you had to earn. And right. mm. uh, and and so I it was a very like the environment was such that you couldn't talk to anyone. The only person you could talk to was the teacher. You couldn't make friends with anyone else in the shala. Uh, and so it it was actually a breeding ground for abuse of all mm. kinds. Mm. And uh, because there was this fear that you don't have any other place to go and practice that. And, and this was this drug that you had, right, of Ashtanga, which you absolutely loved, for which you were willing to jump out of bed at 5 a.m. Mm. You know. So you you knew that if you screwed this up, you wouldn't have any other place. And mm. so it, it's like this um, thing that pushes you to, uh, you know, into a thing where this person is controlling everything that you're doing that oh you should not be on instagram you should not do this you should oh, wow. not talk to yeah, yeah. you know uh, and, and yes, in, um... in little little ways it's the seed is sown you know and i mm. i'm surprised and i you know before i would never understand why you know a lot of people have in the past uh, shamed the women saying oh if they were getting abused they should have just left it's not that easy 
because it's something that you've discovered it's something that's healing you and if you mm. if you don't have any other place to go to then what happens so you you know you and it's also cognitive dissonance mm. it's when you have distance from the places when you understand that you were being abused yeah. mm. whether mm. it is abuse of power or sexual abuse or any mm. other form mm. of abuse right mm. so it's only when you have distance is when it unravels Mm, mm. when you're there and you're in that situation you you can't your mind does not process it so i you know i i i've seen it from that aspect and i think that um you know i'm extremely grateful to that teacher for everything i have you know i love my my so practice because of this teacher but i've also had a lot of trauma because of the abuse um and obviously two truths can coexist so um yeah yeah, yeah but yeah so you know to answer your question i think a lot of people i saw there were people who needed help which i didn't mm. think this teacher was qualified to take on they were there because they needed that mental help right mm. and he was trying to be everything for them you know where you had to write emails to this teacher and tell this person your personal life issues and everything it was just control of everything from mm. diet to uh you know what you wore to your social media everything was stopped so it 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 becomes like a a a very controlling structure well wow. yeah it just puzzles me so much why humans want to control each other like that i mean i think it's like as you yeah. rightly said right it's yeah. um uh, it's it it lies on competition at the end of the day because if you right. can't control your student and the person's going to leave and go elsewhere but if you get the sworn loyalty to your student then the person's not going to go anywhere true true and then if yeah yeah and then if you pull at the emotions then it's the yeah. easiest way to kind of corral people because you've kind of got them emotionally attached right yeah you've got um, emotionally attached and you've got I mean, people I mean, who are spilling I mean, their secrets yeah. to you and yes, then you're exactly. scared about uh, and I think it's a it, Yeah, Sorry, getting out. I mean, I, no, I, I mean, I think what you're painting here. Sorry to interrupt you and say it <laughs> is an incredibly valuable picture because the more I hear about people's stories in the Ashtanga world, the more I hear this is common, actually. So, so thank you for for bringing this to light and and so well, actually, because it is a very common thing, and I think many people listening will will resonate with those words that you, you know the way that you've uh, explained this. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that um, at this point? I mean, how many years has it been since you've had a self practice now? Do you feel that it's um? Do you feel out out of the woods, as it were? Do you feel? I mean, are are you still medicating? Um, do you has it uh, healed you completely, or, or is it still a journey for you? So uh, I was on that whole trip about um, uh, when I started. The doctor had told me, you know, it's going to be one and a half years of medication, mm. and mm. I didn't. I was just fighting that at some point, and then at some point, I just realized, okay, you know, when things got better, I realized, okay, this is this is working. Uh, I was open right from the beginning for medication, so I didn't have to go through that mindset of. taking medication i was like mm. okay i trust you and um i'm going to go with this i i think i just didn't want the one i wanted the one and a half years to get over really quickly uh and at at one of the sessions uh he said that you are fine you've just it's been phenomenal how you have progressed and i'm going to now peter out the medication mm. and i went like a hero and i went cold turkey Hmm. which is actually the most dangerous thing to do right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. because then i went right back Did to you? where i had hmm. started yeah i mean that was a question kind of partic- yeah. particularly particularly framed up with the stupid advice of your teacher to just stop the medication because this is really really dangerous and um She so kept putting it into my head, you know. Yeah, even, yeah. even, you know, at at various points or in that one very, year when I was very, taking, yeah. 
very was, silly instruction. It was, um, it was, he yeah. kept saying, oh, are you still on the medication? Are you still on the medication? Mm, 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 and mm. and it, it sort of played at the back of my mind, right? And um, and I, you know, one day I just went cold turkey on the medication after that meeting with my doctor. And I went back to square one. And the doctor yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. you know, I, you <laughs> have been like, all the work that you've done is just like wasted. Yeah. And yeah, and then, you know, I think for me, like I'm not, I don't take it every day. Right. Uh, I've been irregular with it, but I think the tools, uh, I I take it, uh, like when I remember, I take it. Um, I've not been very good with being really like taking it every day, but I'm functioning fine. I Mm -hmm. know when I need to take it and I know, you know, that it stays in my system for some time. Right. So if I miss a couple of days, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, but I think that for me, I'm not saying everybody should be on medication for me. I needed it. Mm, not everybody mm. needs medication. I think if you're milder forms of depression, I think yoga can heal you. Uh, but I think for, you know, somebody who's, you know, had long term depression, I think medication is important. But see, each to their own. I, I'm not here to say. Absolutely. That my, no, my no, we, we can't. Or, yeah, yeah, no, we can't. Um, we can't generalize. Yeah, we can't generalize on other people's experience. All. Of course not. Yeah, it, I mean, I suppose what I wanted to say is for me, it was incredibly difficult to come. I mean, for me, I think I don't know uh, what medication you were you were given, but for me, it was antidepressants. Um, so something like Prozac, I suppose I was given, and I was on it for a few years. Um, coming off it was hideous. It was incredibly hard, and mm. the only way I, I mean, you know, and the only way I got through it was with acupuncture, actually, in yoga. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but it was, it was easily. I mean, I think I, I think it was. I, I I won't say that it wasn't important to go on it in the first place. I think it was, but it was equally as hard to get off it. To be honest with you, you know? mm, it was yeah. very very hard, very hard to stop it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, again, it's not everyone's. You know, it's not everyone's. Um, needs to you don't need to stop it. Um, but yeah. for me, I felt it was possible. Uh, but it was very very hard to come off it. Very hard. Um, and took a couple of years with yoga. Um, so I was practicing tw- twice, twice a day just to uh, just to get up wow. the, serotonin, the serotonin levels again. I just felt like yeah. I'd fallen off the edge of a cliff, really, when it, I stopped taking it. Um, wow. Uh, so, yeah, that was a, it's, yeah, it's worth uh, just putting it out there. I think that medication is useful and don't stop your medication just because you feel better either <laughs> yeah. yeah like you know just like yeah yeah it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, like it's, you really not, have it's, to it's, get it it's, petered it's, out it's, by the doctor no it's it's serious stuff it's serious stuff and i i did come off it over a couple of years actually i did manage in the end uh, you know to uh, to not take it oh uh, it doesn't mean that it suffer from depression but um mm. yeah it's, it's an ongoing process i suppose um how how has your practice progressed now i mean what uh, as you as you go on practice um is it still throwing things up uh what do you you know what do you struggle with uh, still in practice um and perhaps has it created other issues because i know a lot of people have practiced and felt better and then subsequently as i did then fallen into other patterns which are negative around yoga again because you're like a kind of sticky bun in a way you know <laughs> when you're in this in this state for picking up other things so i ended up kind of exacerbating a latent tendency for let's say ineffective eating habits right because you're getting you know you're fit you know you go from kind of being overweight as i was you know kind of mm. drinking and, he- and smoking heavily to feeling really strong and and then and then you start getting obsessed with that so you start kind of getting obsessive yeah. around your food right so you start kind of missing meals and, and thinking well you know you feel kind of good after missing a meal so you get lighter and then you feel better you know you're feeling like you're better at yoga you're getting lighter you know so you start you know you kind of um you know, basically not eating enough, you know, and uh, and obsessing about your figure as opposed to other people's. You see other guys or other women in the room. They're looking, you know, you, you know, you think, oh, I'd like to look like that. You know, they're, they're, and they look so good at their practice. And, you know, so I think it also, the yoga can, it can it also bring oh, to the yeah, fore. For sure. it, it can bring to the fore well. other issues. Yeah. It did, yeah. right? Okay. It did for me as well. Like, I think because I, like for me, I have always been uh, somebody who has had a high metabolism. So I've always been thin. Then I went through a phase where I'd had a, 
uh, when I was really like, I was like on flights four times a week. Um, and so I landed up eating a lot of rubbish because when you're on the road, like, you know, um, mm-hmm. you, you can't really, uh, you know, eat home food or take mm. home food to office. So I was eating a lot of rubbish and that's when I put on a lot of weight and I, you know, had a, like a hairline fracture because of trying to run or whatever. And that's when I got into yoga. And then because I discovered this thing, which was clean eating and, you know, I went into this, I went into the smoothie thing. It like, it was crazy. Mm. I was paying duties. I feel guilty, but I'm going to be honest. I mean, I was ordering like the most expensive chia seeds and acai <laughs> powders and cacao and everything got a Vitamix. And, you know, I was like, you know, spending like crazy amount of money on berries and whatnot. Um, and then as you rightly said, like, you know, uh, automatically then I went from like, I, I suddenly had this aversion to meat and then uh, I suddenly discovered I was lactose intolerant. And, and then I just went into this crazy eating pattern, which wasn't actually working for me. Mm. Uh, how do you know? And, how do you, you know that? Uh, because I, you, I, it, it just happened that uh, you know there was this one uh, really good restaurant that, which was uh, you know a clean eating restaurant which had opened very close to my house, and the days my cook wouldn't turn up, I would go there post work. It became my kitchen. And uh, the days and, and, you know, the owner's husband happened to be there and, you know, we, we were ha- landed up having this conversation. And I said, you know, if I don't eat here, I get stressed out because then I'm going to eat rubbish. And, uh, you know, when before I take a flight, I would, you know, get them to pack me food. It, I thought it was crazy. And then he he I think noticed that. And I think that for me was like a turning point because he said, um, there's this place in India, which is called Ladakh, which is extremely like, it's, it's a mountain desert. Um, and, um, you only get instant noodles there. Yeah. Yeah. So um, up to, yeah. In yeah. The north, and north, in uh, the north. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. In, in the north, in, uh, you know, in the state, it used to be in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So, um, I, he said, what if you go to Ladakh? What are you going to eat there? You're not going to get gluten-free, uh, refined sugar-free stuff there. You're going to eat the Maggie noodles, right? So yeah. that sort of like put me like in sort of perspective. And I, I also noticed because I was being so fixated about my food, like blinkers on, I also mm-hmm. realized I was being, my mind had not had become closed in some ways i was being difficult about things and not being open minded and i i felt the moment i you know mm. i mean it was like became like a flexitarian i felt i was more open more receptive to people and also to it kind of, yeah because it, it kind of closes you to to sharing food with each other right with other people Right. Yeah, because you're constantly yeah. obsessing about yeah. food, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, because you want to you want to eat a particular type of food. Mm. And if you go mm. out with your friends who are your non-yoga mm. friends, then you're fussing about them on the menu because you're like, hey, there's nothing here I can eat. Or, oh, you know, man. being over... Just, over... I find it so, so ironic that you're in, you know, land in Mumbai, which we talked before the program, before we started, about how incredible the food is there and on the street food, you know, and you're eating smoothies and all the time. Uh, you know. <laughs> it would be yeah. funny but it's not funny you know you know and as you know thank you for bringing that up because it's it's I think that's something that uh this unhealthy eating patterns and you know it's something that when I was doing conversations beyond asana something that I, you know, I would put out this uh insta story saying you know what are the questions you want to ask xyz teacher and yeah, it was yeah. crazy that people didn't want to know what what are the challenges they had in their lives or, you know, uh, where they've screwed up or whatever. They just wanted to know what is she eating or what is he eating? And I was like, right. you've got to be kidding me. Uh, you know, <laughs> why yeah, I mean, does everybody I mean, want to know if, what the diet is? And it's another obsession now. 
Yeah. Yeah. And because I, of the way that food will make you look cosmetically, because all our value, our value is so, so image based now. And also, I think the image that uh, stronger teachers uh, put out of being, uh, sub- I feel also because of social media being so toxic in terms of uh, anybody coming and commenting on anything that you post. So I think teachers also get scared of even putting out that glass of wine that they may be enjoying, right? Without having somebody coming and giving them 500 snarky comments. So I think people are even hiding what they eat and drink. Uh, and because they put out only stuff which looks like they're eating, you know, few leaves or whatever, people land up emulating that and think that's all they're eating. Yeah, I don't think, there's, I don't think there's a complete, into, complete transparency or honesty around, around food at all. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I think like, uh, uh, you know, I think, you know, a lot of teachers have gone or uh, eat meat, but they don't, they don't, they don't, it's not there on their feeds, right? And that's, no. that's not normalizing that, okay, there are some uh, socioeconomic political reasons why people need to eat meat, right? If you're privileged, I, uh, you're I, going I, to fall at that idea. But for certain sections, it is, a, it, it is not possible to, um, you know, be vegan. It's not possible. Uh, and I think also the idea that actually people's metabolisms are so different. So one person, we're looking at these Ashtanga, and I remember first of all seeing Ashtanga yoga bodies and thinking, oh my God, it's just like, this is incredible the way the people look, right? Mm. Um, but actually, you know, like those people that, we have to remember that those people that do it and get to those places, they have a natural propensity for it, right? Like, it's not like, you know, they happened like anyone else on it. Generally speaking, the people that we see at the top are there because of unique cer- set of circumstances, right? Genetic, you know, and predisposition for that kind of, um, you know, for that kind of body, for that kind of ability, right? I mean, I could eat, you know, um, two different people could eat, could eat the same thing and have very different bodies with it, right? I mean, absolutely. I, you know, I don't put on muscle easily. Like I could eat as much, what I was going to say is I could eat as much protein as I liked and I wouldn't look like Mark Roberts, you know? I mean, it just, you know, and I think that there's this, there's this belief that if we just get the right diet and if we just do the same practice as the teacher, that we'll look like them and have the same ability as them. And it's just not true. I mean, bodies react very, very differently to the same foods, right? Agree. And, 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 you know, it's, I also find this uh, problematic when people start subscribing diets, because it's really not, uh, I feel like it's, it's okay to suggest a particular way of eating. But I think, as you rightly said, you know, the two people can eat the same thing, and it can react differently. Um, because of deficiencies, because of you know, genetic material in your body that needs a particular type of food um, and maybe you're not supplementing enough or whatever, right? And so I think that um, I, I just see it from, I, I you know, from a privileged point of view, I see, okay, why everyone can do this. But it's not the case. You look across, you mm-hmm. know, the room that not everyone can eat like you, not everyone can afford to do all the things you're eating or drinking. And so one, you know, just like one needs to be careful about how you treat practitioners with their mental health. It's also about uh, knowing that not everyone is privileged. And there also, is, there the, the, the yoga body isn't inherently a healthy body. The idea of the yoga body is this thin kind of, you know, um, like, yeah. Yes, yeah, toad, yeah. like incredibly toad. That's not necessarily a healthy and body. And it's eating one, and, and also a lot of, you know, and also another thing is that, as you also said, that, you know, the, the ones who are at the top have worked really hard, or whatever, whatever circumstances got them there, but, and their profession is teaching. Not mm, everybody mm. who comes into the yoga room is a teacher. People have to go to jobs and doing, you know, run their own businesses or homemakers or whatever. You can't be surviving on eating one meal a day. 
Mm, mm, that's a very good point. Very good point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you need to, uh, you know, because I remember I was listening no, to somebody's it. live and that person was saying, uh, somebody asked a question and that person was, you know, somebody in the corporate world and she was asking this Ashranga teacher, what do you eat? And she said that, well, I don't eat. I do a three hour practice and then I eat at 12 o'clock. I eat a dry fruits and a salad <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I don't have anything else. That's my main meal. Oh my God. Oh my and God. I was like, I Think, how how it's tri- crazy it's tricky, isn't is it? that recommendation? Yeah, I mean, we try to be honest here, and you and I are trying to be honest. But on the other hand, Sorry. it's you know, one <laughs> yeah. has to, well, no, one has to also be careful that um, that honesty um, might be taken literally by other people and emulated. You know, so I mean, it may be you know to to, to the extent that it may work for that teacher somehow, but you have to be careful what you put out there as well because. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that was a message that one would want to put out there, that you should eat one meal a day, especially as most people are, you know, um, householders with responsibilities, jobs, families, and the Ashtanga practice isn't a professional. They're not professional yogis. And what we're seeing now is is professional yogis, right? Exactly. And, uh, you know, and, and that is not the, the, the lifestyle or, you know, the, the daily life to be kind of emulated by regular people who have, other commitments who want to slot in a practice which is incredibly beneficial for those other commitments but you know they're not at the top of their game as a training kind of almost professional yoga teacher right in a, in a competitive world where they have to exactly. almost almost be at the top of their game to to get the students you know yeah and it's um you you said this really well because it's it's for them it's uh you know, you do, they're not going to do three hour practices. They're just coming in doing, you know, if they can manage a 45 minute, then that's the time they've got because everything's like you're rushing uh, to work mm-hmm. and whatever you have to get ready and da, 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 you know, you're, everything's chop, chop, chop. So you, uh, you, you, and if you're, if you're working, you need your brain to, uh, to operate. It can't be starved of food. So I think, you know, for me, that's something I find, um, you know, giving dietary advice, which is um, one size fits all, is something um, unreal and not fair to the practitioner. Yeah, yeah. And also around practice as well. If they, I mean, I see teachers pushing students who have got to go to work and work eight hours a day and they're being pushed to do Kapitasana again and again. And I just kind of think, well, that's going to, you know, I mean, that's just not realistic in terms of the demands of one's day, you know. Yeah, because you need the energy to do the rest of your stuff. You can't be putting every, all, giving all of your energy on the yoga mat. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it's been yeah. done about an hour. It's been incredible to talk to you. Let me just ask you a couple of questions just to round up. I usually ask these little ones as fun at the end. So, so can you give me just an inspiration, something that inspires you in your life? It can be a book or a person or a, or a place. And uh, one guilty pleasure. So an inspiration and a guilty pleasure just to, just to round off the interview, Pratima. Oh wow! Um, I I think inspiration is comes from different things, right? In different phases of life, so it's mm, not just mm, one yeah, person. No, absolutely. Uh, no. Uh, so maybe I right think, now. Uh, I think if you're looking at it right now, because I'm in this whole um, situation in India, so I I think for me, an inspiration is a journalist who I particularly think is being really brave and speaking up and speaking truth to power. So I think for me, that's my inspiration because she's owning her truth in this world. Uh, so for me, that's an inspiration. Guilty pleasure. And who, who is that? Who is that journalist? Th- there's a journalist called Rana Ayub. Um, okay. Uh, so she, I, I think that, you know, she, despite all the threats that she's had and uh, death threats, rape threats, uh, you know, her photograph being morphed mm. on porn sites, everything, uh, people stalking her, following her, her phone being tapped. Despite that, as a woman, she is standing up and speaking truth to power. So I think that's mm. just mm. really like, you know, I think being honest and authentic with her profession and her sense of purpose so I think for me that you know she's someone who really is inspiring me in the yoga world I think someone who uh, has really inspired me to be uh, and has helped me mold my journey has been my teacher Deepika Mehta uh, because she's taught me that um that no one's perfect, that she herself is imperfect. She herself is taking help on stuff that she doesn't know enough 
about. Mm. And but she is at the top of her game with respect to whatever. As a teacher, when she shows up, she is at. There is no one as hardworking as her. There's no one who gives so much of herself to um, uh, this, her students, um, you know, above and beyond. She doesn't hold back. Uh, and she's mm. really like your biggest cheerleader and pushing you to, you know, uh, be the best version of yourself. And she sees in you what you don't see in uh you know, like, you know, she believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I well, don't mean the, like with respect yeah. to the asana. Uh, with respect to guilty Fantastic. pleasure, I think yeah. um, I, I love food. So for me, I think, uh, you know, <laughs> anything which... Yeah, I, I, no, I think like those are on like when I'm being good, but otherwise like nothing, what nothing kind of like what a kind good, of like, a like dark chocolate or okay. you know a good dessert or whatever, or a glass of wine and uh, you know binge watching Netflix or something, <laughs> <laughs> K dramas, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay dramas, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, well, it's been wonderful to have you and thanks for coming on. And it's been really, um, yeah, like a heartwarming discussion we've had. I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, I've and loved I talking to you, Adam. Yeah. I, I, thank you for having me on. And it's been great uh, chatting with you. And uh, thank you for allowing a space to be honest about uh, uh, well, things. This is what it's all about now. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for coming on. <laughs> thank you. Take care.